When I first started teaching, I always found cracking to be one of the more stressful practicals to manage. Um, the students don't always necessarily see what you want them to see, I found. Uh, and then, of course, there was always the specter of suck back and the potential risky consequences thereof to contend with. So when I moved schools back in 2014, and therefore, of course, science technicians, hi Gwen, by the way, if you're watching, um, I ordered a cracking practical and was kind of surprised when Gwen showed up with some, essentially some pasta pipettes and bits of tubing. I didn't, didn't really know what I was supposed to be doing with them. It, it turned out that she'd been on a course with Bob Worley, of course, uh, and had seen how to do the reaction in the microscale version. We never quite got the reaction to go quite as well as Gwen had seen it on Bob's course. Um, so I sort of battled with this reaction over the last couple of years, learned some lessons, and in today's video what we're going to do is it's going to be the first of a two-parter. We're going to really sort of take a deep dive into getting this reaction to work really well for you, uh, whether or not you want to run it as a practical or generate large quantities of alkenes for further demonstrations which we'll be using next time. So let's get straight into it. So CLEAPS members should be consulting PP061 for this practical. Essentially what it describes is turning one of these pasta pipettes into a little test tube by sealing off the end and then um, you can load this up with your substrate, a bit of mineral wool, aluminium oxide and then the gases that you produce can be bubbled through a delivery tube directly into some bromine water or some potassium permanganate for example and you can watch it decolorize. What I'm going to be showing you today is actually a slightly modified version for collecting larger quantities of gases for demonstration purposes and we're going to be using one of those gases in something really cool that's coming up in the next video. So here's the first tip. If you try to seal the pipette as is, you'll end up with a very narrow, weak seal. On top of this, the paraffin won't be able to get into the end of the pipette. So before you seal the pipette, simply snap a little piece off the end and you'll get a really nice finish. Next, load in about half a centimeter cubed of paraffin. Tip number two here. This caused me no end of misery over the last few years. In different places, paraffin might be called different things. I've wasted hours and hours trying and failing to get good results out of lighter paraffin, sometimes sold as kerosene. You want to be using heavy paraffin, sometimes called medicinal paraffin. It should be reasonably viscous. Now, a little bit of mineral wool can be inserted to absorb the paraffin. If you have it, a micro spatula might be handy for this, but I always just snip a wooden splint down to size. If you don't happen to have mineral wool, glass wool really doesn't do the trick. It's worth getting in some proper mineral wool, you won't regret it. Onto the wool, you can load some aluminium oxide. One to two micro spatulas is plenty. To set up the heating, simply take your pipette, clamp it horizontally, having connected it through a piece of silicone tubing to your delivery tube. Students can run the product gases straight through bromine water to watch it decolorize, but if you want to collect larger quantities for demonstration purposes, a setup more like this one is handy. I've added a bit of food coloring to the water to help it show up on camera. I'm using three-way Lua Lock stopcock valves but in principle you can accomplish the same thing with a Hoffman tubing clamp. Likewise, you can get syringe caps or you can just use bits of sticky tack. The valves do make the process a little bit easier though. An ethanol spirit burner gives a flame hot enough to crack the paraffin but not hot enough to melt the pipette. Here's another tip from Bob. For cracking paraffin, position your ethanol spirit burner right at the intersection between the catalyst and the mineral wool. An almost identical setup can be used to dehydrate propen 2 ol to give propene, which we'll need in the next video, but for the propen 2 ol the point of heating should be a little bit further from the substrate. You will see the catalyst darken as carbon begins to deposit on the surface at the start of the reaction. Of course, you'll want to discard the first bits of expanded air coming off before filling your syringes with the product gas as you see fit.
if for some reason students didn't get to see what you wanted them to see, this is the nice thing, you can always just squirt some of your collected gas into some sample vials containing potassium permanganate or bromine water and shake to decolorize. The product gas will burn of course with a smoky flame. Now the great thing about this version of the practical is of course that there's real limitations for how bad things can get with your suck back. First of all is the fact that you've got much smaller volumes of gas to deal with and therefore you would get very little suck back actually coming back into the tube. And even if you do there aren't any nasty consequences because the tube cools down so quickly that even if water does get back in there you tend not to actually see anything too exciting happening. The other cool thing about the fact that you are using a smaller scale apparatus is that it cools down really quickly, allowing for tidy up to be much more efficient, leaving you more meaningful time for discussion at the end of the practical. So that's it for cracking. Next time we're going to use basically the same setup to create some propene gas and hydrogenate it in a demonstration so simple and effective you will not believe it. In between now and then, make sure you get some practice in using the uh, microscale setup. Good luck and I'll see you in a couple of months for part two.